Welcome to Whiskey Cast, Cask Strength Conversation, featuring news and interviews from the world of whiskey. I'm Mark Gillespie. This is episode number 1055 for May 5th, 2024. Coming up in a few minutes. We're not going to try to pretend we're doing anything. We want to be very, very open. Our story is authentic. Everything that we do is authentic. We want to tell people where we're sourcing because we're actually very proud of the partners we have where we source our whiskey from because we're very, very confident that they're creating great whiskeys. It's been almost three years since Brian Nation gave up his safe and secure job at Ireland's Middleton Distillery to move to Minnesota and become master distiller for the startup O'Shaughnessy Distilling Company. His blends of Irish and American whiskeys have been highly regarded, and the distillery is about to start bottling its first homegrown whiskeys. I'll catch up with Brian Nation later on Whiskey Cast in depth, and I'll have tasting notes for his upcoming 21 year old single malt in the What I'm Tasting This Week department. That's just ahead, along with our community segment, behind the label, and much more. The news is next on this week's Whiskey Cast. And now, a message from Robin Redbreast. So, in Spain, they call Redbreast Petit Rocco. It's me, but a touch more exotic. Kind of like a Redbreast PX edition. Finished in Pedro Jimenez casks, adding a velvety and decadent dimension. You know, I won't lie. A climate like this makes me wish I was a migratory bird. Proud sponsor of Whiskey Cast. Redbreast. Pass it on. Hey everyone, it's me, Gabriel Cartarella with yours, and I'm here to introduce you to something very special. We've gone and blended the time-honored whiskey craftsmanship of Scotland with the whiskey-making finesse of Japan. And let me tell you, it's something truly remarkable. More on that in a minute. Let's get started with the news. It's brought to you by the Dalmore. Beam Suntory is no more. Ten years after Suntory acquired Beam Global for $16 billion, the company is being rebranded as Suntory Global Spirits. The move is designed to bring together the global brands Suntory owns with its Japanese base at Suntory Holdings. No other major changes are expected. Japan's new industry-wide agreement on rules for the authenticity of Japanese whiskey have taken effect. Those rules were announced in 2021 and require anything labeled Japanese whiskey to be 100% distilled, aged, and bottled in Japan. That's not expected to stop a decades-long practice of importing Scotch or Canadian whiskeys and blending them with Japanese whiskey for the domestic market. Suntory has confirmed that all of its export whiskeys comply with the new rules, while Nika has acknowledged that its Nika Days and Nika from the Barrel whiskies do not meet all of the criteria. The rules do not consider whiskey made from rice using koji-style fermentation to officially be considered whiskey, though they do count as whiskey under U.S. regulations. Buffalo Trace is opening its first outpost outside of Kentucky Monday with the debut of Buffalo Trace Distillery London. The Covent Garden location is a key area for tourists visiting London from all over the world, and it's one of the reasons Buffalo Trace Home Place director Ed Bell and his team picked London for the site. The location is uh, super important to us. We're we're very excited to be bringing the storytelling of Frankfurt, Kentucky here to, to the UK. Um, we know that um, the UK is uh, the biggest uh, market for American whiskey outside of the US, but also one that's been super receptive to um, our products and 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 um, has a, a great opportunity for us to to further develop. So it's a it's a tasting uh, tasting experience as well as a retail environment, and we wanted to bring it to a key city, which gets that um, gets that UK audience, uh, gets that local international audience from elsewhere in Europe, and we could bring bring that piece of Kentucky um, across the pond in a meaningful way. What will people see when they visit Buffalo Trace Distillery London? So we have two tasting room um, experiences, one named Taste of the Trace and the second um, called Tradition and Change. It's intimate yet social tasting experiences. So it's led by um, led by one of our team members who are 
craftsmen, storytellers designed to lead people through um, a tasting session, obviously focused on Buffalo Trace, but also a couple of our other products from the distillery. And the the taste of the trace um, experience around 45 minutes is really intended for a general audience, bringing people in. We think it's going to be perfect for a date night or a group family and friends experience, maybe even a, a work team build with clients um and again uh, intimate session but nevertheless uh, designed to be social um whereas the second uh, bar and the second space that we've uh, crafted um for tradition and change is uh, slightly more elevated in terms of not only the time that it's going to take slightly longer about an hour but also in terms of the the profile of of whiskies that we're going to be serving probably more for for some audience members that are already familiar with the category already whiskey drinkers um and looking for a, a bit more um in-depth storytelling a bit more exposure to some premium bourbons the site had a soft opening this weekend with a special promotion they took over a phone booth nearby in covent garden and rang it at random to see who might answer they then offered those people a tasting that included samples of pappy van winkle 23 year old bourbon in other news, Hunter Lang & Company's Ardenaho Distillery is releasing its first single malt this week. Inaugural release is a five-year-old Isla single malt that's the first whiskey from a new distillery on the island since Kilhoman in 2009. It'll be available through the Ardenaho website and retailers in the UK and 20 other export markets. Also from Isla, Lagavulin is out with the fourth edition in the Offerman series of single malts, produced in partnership with actor and comedian Nick Offerman. This one is an 11-year-old single malt finished for eight months in Caribbean rum casks. It's available for $99.99 a bottle, and I'll have my tasting notes for it later on. Canada's Wayne Gretzky Distillery in Ontario is out with its first homegrown Canadian whiskey. Signature Rye is a five-year-old whiskey matured in a combination of ex-bourbon and virgin oak casks along with some recharred American oak. It's a limited edition release available through the Wayne Gretzky Estates website for $49.95 Canadian a bottle. I'll have my tasting notes for it later on as well. Barrel Craft Spirits is out with a new Mizanara oak-finished bourbon. It's a blend of bourbons from Indiana, Kentucky, and Tennessee, finished for a year and a half in Japanese oak, and bottled at cask strength. It's available online at the Barrel Craft Spirits website for $89.99 a bottle. Bob Dylan's Heaven's Door Whiskey has released the first in a new exploration series of bourbons. Series 1 is a five-year-old bourbon finished in Calvados brandy casks and will be the first of two annual releases in the series. It's available through the Heaven's Door website and at retailers for $79.99 a bottle. And finally, Tennessee's Cascade Hollow Distillery has released this year's offering of George Dickel Bottled in Bond. It's a 12-year-old Tennessee whiskey distilled in the spring of 2011 and selected by Dickel Master Distiller Nicole Austin. It'll be available with a suggested retail price of $44.99 a bottle. You can keep up with the latest whiskey news all week long at WhiskeyCast.com and in the WhiskeyCast community app. The news is brought to you by the Dalmore. Hello, Richard Patterson here, master distiller, master blender for the Dalmore. You know, whenever the team and I are in the world sharing our exceptional single malt, we like to keep in touch with Mark Gillespie and the latest news from Whiskey Cast. Let's check the calendar now and see what's happening around the world of whiskey. Tickets are still available for Whiskey and Barrel Night Thursday night in New York City, along with Whiskey Live Dublin the weekend of May 17th and 18th. The Campbellton Malts Festival takes place on the 21st and 22nd in Campbellton, Scotland. Whiskey Fet 2024 takes place in Montreal on May 23rd. And the Fagiel, the Isla Festival of Malt and Music, kicks off on May 24th and runs through June 1st. If you're organizing a whiskey event, let us know about it. We'll add it to the calendars at whiskeycast.com and in the WhiskeyCast community app. Juris has truly been innovative in perfecting cast finishing, which has led to exceptional expressions of our craftsmanship. This extra step allows our whiskey to further mature in carefully selected casks and marks the final stage of our double aging process. 
or in Dewar's case, our double-double aging method, resulting in unique, indulgent tasting experiences. The new Dewar's double-double 21-year Mizanara oak cask finish undergoes a meticulous four-stage aging process, including being finished and sought-after Japanese Mizanara oak casks. Crafting these casks is challenging due to the non-straight growth of Mizanara oak, and it takes 200 years for these trees to reach full potential. The result? A masterfully balanced whiskey with notes of sandalwood, coconut, and creamy vanilla to name a few. And while it's not the easiest to find, it's an unmissable experience. Whiskey Cast In Depth is brought to you by Mortlock and the Classic Malts lineup. It's been almost three years since Brian Nation packed up his family and moved from Ireland's Middleton Distillery to become master distiller for the startup O'Shaughnessy Distilling Company in Minneapolis. He's been laying down stocks of whiskey at the distillery while blending their Keeper's Heart blends of whiskeys from Ireland's Great Northern Distillery and MGP in Indiana. Later this summer, Keeper's Heart will release a 21-year-old Irish single malt finished in Tokai wine casks. Brian brought that whiskey and the rest of the range to a media tasting the other night at New York City's Flatiron Room, and we sat down after dinner to catch up. So you've made the transition well, it seems. You're uh, adjusting to Minnesota nicely, uh, throwing out the first pitch at a Twins game. For, for all that says to it, how has the transition been for you? The transition has been fantastic, both for me and my family. I mean, you know, you talk about throwing out the first pitch. Who'd have thought for a guy from Ireland that is more used to playing, holding a hurley in his hand than holding a baseball gets the opportunity to do that. So it's been a lot of fun. It's been hard work. It's been busy. Um, but, you know, all in all, it's been great. It's been great for the family. It's been great for me. How are things going at the distillery? Distillery is going extremely well. I mean, we've been... We've been very fortunate with the whiskies that we've been releasing that they have actually created a lot of buzz and a lot of interest. I mean, our Irish American and our Irish Plus Bourbon has been, have been whiskies that are now in 21 states and are really taking off and people are loving the taste profile. They're loving the fact that this blend of Irish and American whiskey is creating that extra dimension of flavor, taste profile and complexity that you wouldn't get with 100% Irish or 100% American whiskey. And and then we have our single Irish whiskies like the 10-year-old single malt that is something that is creating a, a, a excitement as well because of the award it won in 2023 with the international or with the San Francisco International Spirits Competition. And then we also have brought out different iterations of our Keeper's Heart Irish Plus American at 110 proof and our Keeper's Heart Irish Plus Bourbon at 118 proof, our cast strength. And they, they've gone down exceptionally well because what I've seen is something different to Ireland is that there's a big interest in higher proof whiskies in the US, which is a big learning for me. How has that adjustment been to uh, higher proof whiskies? You know, initially I would have been a little bit um, slow to enjoy them. But what I find is when we look at our 110 proof and our 118 proof, what I do find is that because of the influence of the Irish whiskey, what you're getting is that neither of these drinks taste like or drink like 110 proof or 118. What the Irish whiskey does is it actually helps with bringing some of that burner bite from that higher proof whiskey down without losing any of the flavor or character of the whiskey. And I think it's something that has been commented on a lot around our Irish plus bourbon cast strength is that, you know, at that 118, you've got everything you want in the flavor profile of the whiskey, but you've got limited burner bite in the, in, in the, in the finish, which is fantastic. When are we going to start seeing your whiskies that you're distilling at O'Shaughnessy Distilling? Yeah, so our whiskies have been laid down since September 2021. So our uh, American single pot still is actually w- reaching three years in September. So our, our intention is that we will release that whiskey in Q4 of 2025 as a four-year-old whiskey. We're also producing a triple pot distilled rye and a triple pot distilled bourbon. And the intention is to release these as four-year-old releases in 26 and 27. And then obviously we will hold back some of, the, some of our distillate to mature older and bring out some older skews later on as well. 
we were very happy with the actual taste profile and the maturation process that's going on. It's really creating whiskies that American whiskies, like when you talk about the triple pot distilled rye or bourbon, they taste unlike any other bourbon or rye that's out there at the moment. And that's something that's really exciting for us. How important was it to you to try to recreate Irish whiskey? You know, in, in, in terms of recreating Irish whiskey, obviously, look, I'm very proud of where I came from. I'm very proud of the the experience and the opportunities I had in Ireland in the, in, in the distilling industry. But I, I think when, you're, when you come here and you want to produce uh, American whiskey using that kind of quintessential Irish style of triple copper pot distillation, you also want to put your own stamp on it. And you have to put your own stamp on it as well because you're also using virgin American oak barrels predominantly. And when you do that, you have to create a heavier style of distillate to be able to actually complement the wood. What I don't want to have happen is the wood to totally take over on our whiskey and we lose the distillate influence because that's very important for me. So creating a whiskey that has a, a nice balance of that wood influence with the distillate uh, coming forward is something that's truly important. So in that respect, I think that's that's another impact of the Irish kind of style of whiskey. But the triple pot distillation process allows you to create a flavoursome distillate that is willing to and able to stand up to that virgin American oak as well. How is that whiskey holding up under the uh, Minnesota climate in maturation? Yeah, well, you know, during the winter, obviously, it gets extremely cold. So what we've decided to do is mature all of our whiskey in uh, temperature-controlled warehouses, generally 55 to 60 degrees uh, Fahrenheit. But then we leave it free-rise during the summer. We don't, we don't necessarily want to control the, uh, the temperature rise during the summer. But one of the things we don't know truly is how the wood or how the, the winters, the cold winters will impact on the distillation or on the maturation process. So what we've done is we've taken some barrels and left them mature in, a st- in, in on temp- non-temperature controlled warehouses see, s- to see what happens. And that's an interesting experiment to do as well. You talked about the 10 year old single malt. Right now that's made with whiskey from Cooley Distillery. In the coming years, you're going to be blending in Great Northern Distillery whiskey into it. How do you differentiate the two? Do you try to differentiate them, or do you blend them together? Well, that's an interesting uh, opportunity for us, because that will be coming up actually in around 2026, uh, when we actually move from from Cooley Distilling uh, Mature Liquid to actually Great Northern Distillery. And, I mean, the reality of it is, is that there are two different styles of distillate, but they're great, they're both great malt whiskies. So do you decide to blend them through and, and kind of make that transition slowly, or do you take a step change? I'm of the opinion at the moment that I'd like to, to, to make a step change and kind of be very clear and open to everybody that we've moved from one distillery to the other. And then it's, there's, a, there's a learning curve as well in terms of how long, how long do we need to actually finish that whiskey in the Malaga wine barrels as well, because we found four months was good enough for the, the Cooley distillery uh, uh, malt. But who knows how long it's going to take with the Great Northern. It could be shorter or longer. And that's, that, to me, is an exciting challenge. It's an exciting opportunity. It's not something that I'm worried about or, or shy away from. I think that that's just a great opportunity. The one thing that I would say is that as long as you're open and honest about what you're doing, I think people will appreciate that and will, will actually enjoy to see the difference. That's the one area where I think you guys have been unusually transparent in is being being open about the sourcing and where you're getting your whiskeys from until your whiskey is ready. Yeah, for me and also for David Perkins, obviously, who's a, an investor and, and board member, uh, that has been extremely important, the whole integrity, the authenticity of everything we do. We're not going to try to pretend we're doing anything we want to be very very open our story is authentic everything that we do is authentic we want to tell people where we're sourcing because we're actually very proud of the partners we have where we source our whiskey from because we're very very confident that they're creating great whiskies so much so that when you you know if you come to our distillery or even at some events that we do outside of the distillery we actually taste people on the components to show them the quality of the components that go into our blend and I think anybody that tastes them would agree that either one of those components could actually find their way in as a, as a whiskey, a standalone whiskey themselves. And I think it's great. I think you have to be because, look, at the end of the day, 
if you're not honest and open with people, people will find out, and you lose all your integrity, and that's something that's that we do not want to do in our in our, in our business, you know. Last year, you took your whiskeys to Ireland for the first time. What was the reaction? Um, for me, initially, it was extremely worrying and extremely nervous. You know, I would have done and presented our whiskeys in, in, across the U.S. For, for 12, 15 months, and then we decided we were going to launch in Ireland. And I, I still remember the day we launched. It was extremely nerve-wracking because you were going back to your peers in Ireland, you were going back to all your friends, and you were producing a whiskey that wasn't essentially 100% Irish whiskey, and you were presenting this this new style to people the reaction was amazing um, every event was sold out and not alone that but what we found is that the interest and the 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 the, the love of what we were doing was, was shown in the fact that we sold out of our first batch that we brought over to Ireland um, we then brought a second batch across and one of the things we realised as well is that you know I'm not in Ireland all the time and you do need somebody that is there actually flying the flag for what we're doing so we went in search of somebody and look you know we were very fortunate to to get Ger Garland to come on board as an international brand ambassador for us now Ger Garland you know he's he's well known in, in, in whiskey terms but not just as a, a whiskey aficionado or a knowledgeable guy but he's got such an ability to build fantastic relationships with people and people within the whiskey world and the, the bar world and, and, and off premise world have an amazing amount of respect for the guy so having him as part of our team has been a fantastic addition Tell me about the 21-year-old that you're coming out with in July. Yeah, very excited about that one. It's a 21-year-old Cooley uh, single malt that we finished in Tokai barrels for 14 months. Um, you know, I remember when we were doing it, uh, Patrick and, and Michael O'Shaughnessy, our co-founders, were kind of asking, you know, really, Tokai, would you really do it? I'm going, oh, yeah, yeah, I'm fully convinced this will work. Six months into it, they were asking how it was going, and I was tasting the whiskey going, Jesus, there's nothing happening here. What are we going to do? And I'm telling them, oh, it's working fine. No problem, no problem. But as kind of we moved into eight months, nine months, you started to get a, a beautiful impact of the of, of the Takai barrel. And I just wanted to leave it go that little bit longer without losing the whole DNA of this fantastic 21-year-old single malt. And basically, we have a whiskey that, for me, delivers a lot in terms of flavor profile, in terms of mouthfeel, and in terms of just a total taste experience that brings you on a journey, not just in terms of the, the distillate, but also in the life of the Takai barrel, because you've got so much going on in, in relation to the, the, the fruits. Also, some of the sweetness and acidity that Tokai delivers on the, on the whiskey has been amazing. And then you've really kept that, we've really kept that whole biscuit cereal and fruitiness of, uh, of the malt whiskey to life as well, which is, which is what we needed to do. I have to ask, what did Barry Crockett say when you tasted him on your whiskeys? Do you know, I, I've, I've been in contact with Barry lots and lots of times. Myself and Barry still keep in contact. And, you know, I've absolute ultimate respect for the man. Um, I haven't tasted him on any whiskeys yet, would you believe? Um, but we do keep in contact. And he's just a great guy. And I have so much respect for him. Do you miss Ireland? Obviously, I miss Ireland for lots of different reasons. I miss it for my family and my friends. Um, it's a lot different, though, moving to the U.S. in 2021 than moving to the U.S. in, in, the US in, 20, in 1980 or whatever. There's, it's a lot easier to get back. We're very fortunate that we go back at least twice a year as a family, so we spend Christmas and summer there. And then I get the opportunity to go back more regularly because we are launched in Ireland as well. And, you know, keeping up with friends and keeping up with not just my friends, but my kids keeping up with their friends is done on Facebook. It's done on FaceTime, Google Meet, Zoom. There's all of that, and you can see how people are doing by, because you can see them. And I think that has made a big difference to us. If it was back, you know, where none of that technology existed, it would have been a lot harder. But I will say, as much as we miss Ireland, we're very, very happy here. We're very happy we made the decision. And, you know... It's great to walk home or come home from work in the evening and see a happy family inside in your house just enjoying life, and, and that's what it's all about, and we're, we're certainly having a great time here. Thanks to Brian Nation for joining us on this week's Whiskey Cast in Depth. It's brought to you by Mortlock, whiskey's best-kept secret, hidden away for decades in some of the world's most famous Scotch whiskies, comes a single malt inspired by an original for a fortunate few. 
Discover the entire Mortlock lineup at malts.com. Let's start off the What I'm Tasting This Week department with the new Keeper's Heart 21-year-old Tokai Finished Irish Single Malt. As Brian told us, it'll be out in July and is bottled at 48.5% ABV. The nose has touches of red grapes, baking spices, raspberries, and a fruity and floral character. The taste is tart and peppery, though. It has notes of white pepper, lemon zest, red grapes, and baking spices. The finish is long with touches of raspberries, dried fruits, and lingering spices. I'm scoring the Keeper's Heart 21-year-old Irish single malt a 94. Had the chance the other day to taste the quintessential single malt from Iowa's Cedar Ridge Distillery. It gets its name from the Quint family, which has owned Cedar Ridge for more than 20 years, and is matured using a Solera system of vatting. It's bottled at 46% ABV, and the nose is malty, dusty, and dry with touches of heather, honey, and soft spices. The taste is thick and chewy with notes of barley sugar, honey, apricots, peaches, and gentle baking spices. The finish is long with a subtle touch of baking spices. It's excellent, and I'm scoring the Cedar Ridge Quintessential Single Malt a 94. Next up... My Kentucky Derby Dram Saturday was the new six-year-old Jephtha Creed Weeded Bourbon. This one is bottled at 46.5% ABV, and the nose has touches of caramel, brown sugar, red apples, and dried fruits. The taste is sweet and spicy with a nice balance of caramel and honey with white pepper and clove, while dried fruits provide a nice background note. The finish is long and sweet with a kick of spice, and I'm scoring the Jephtha Creed Weeded Bourbon a 92. I mentioned the new Wayne Gretzky No. 99 Signature Rye during the news. This one is the first whiskey from the Wayne Gretzky Estates Distillery in Ontario and is bottled at 50% ABV. The nose can be described best with one word, dry. It's full of dry wood spices, dried fruits, dried flowers, along with hints of honey and caramel. The taste has a good balance of fruits and spices, as peaches and pears complement clove and allspice notes, with touches of honey and caramel providing a good backdrop. The finish is long, with a hint of fruit and lingering spices. It's a very nice whiskey, and I'm scoring the Wayne Gretzky No. 99 Signature Rye a 93. Finally, let's look at the Lagavulin Offerman Edition 4th release. As I mentioned during the news, it's an 11-year-old Isla single malt finished for 8 months in Caribbean rum casks, and it's bottled at 46% ABV. The nose has peat smoke, molasses cookies, honey, heather, and butterscotch. The taste is smoky, tangy, and sweet, with peat smoke, black pepper, tropical fruits, and a hint of molasses. The finish is long and smoky with lingering spices and tropical fruits. The balance between sweetness and smoke is just right, and I'm scoring the Lagavulin Offerman Edition Caribbean Rum Cask Finish a 94. I'll be adding these whiskeys to our searchable list of tasting notes for nearly 3,700 whiskeys from all over the world. Check it out this week at whiskeycast.com. And now, a message from Robin Redbreast. Kentucky and Ireland have plenty in common. Two homes of horse racing. Mm-hmm. Bluegrass music is said to have Irish roots. Um, okay, it's not the longest list. But the Redbreast Kentucky Oak Edition only strengthens the bond. Finished in sustainably sourced Kentucky Oak for a captivating nose and round taste. I see a triple crown in this thoroughbred's future. Proud sponsor of Whiskey Cast. Redbreast. Pass it on. Let's open up the Whiskey Cast community app and see what people are talking about this week. Our community segment is presented by Waterford Whiskey. Had a couple of comments on the rebranding of Beam Suntory as Suntory Global Spirits this week. Christopher Glenn commented in the app, It always struck me as a little bit odd that they called it Beam Suntory at all when Suntory bought out Beam. And HRC countered with this. I get the change to take the emphasis off of Beam, but as long as they continue to keep Lafroig and Beaumore, as well as Knob Creek brands strong, they can call themselves whatever they want. 
I posted a photo of the Jep the Creed weeded bourbon bottle on social media the other day, and Sean Poche responded on X. I was really impressed with Jep the Creed when I visited back in 2022. Fantastic deliveries. And a couple of days later, he posted this on X. I think whiskey cast might be a bad influence. Picked up a bottle of Jep the Creed four-grain bourbon to toast the end of another semester. Who, me? A bad influence? Never. If you have something you'd like to share with whiskey lovers around the world, download the Whiskey Cast community app and join the conversation. It's free to download from the iOS and Google Play app stores, and you can also find us on X, Threads, Instagram, and Facebook at WhiskeyCast. The email address is comments at whiskeycast.com. Our community segment is presented by Waterford Whiskey on the web at waterfordwhiskey.com. Trevor Harris. Alan Ross and Amy Jackson, Pat and Dennis Booth, Alan Mooney, John McDonnell. Just a few of the growers who helped to make us the biggest distillers of organic whiskey in the world. Waterford Whiskey, the most naturally flavorsome single malt. Let's close out the show now with Behind the Label, our look at the history, science, and people who make whiskey unique. It's brought to you by Balconis Distilling. Saturday was a key anniversary in the history of the bourbon industry. It was the 60th anniversary of the day Congress approved a resolution declaring bourbon as America's native spirit, so to speak. Actually, the resolution declared bourbon to be a distinctive product of the United States, and believe it or not, it almost never passed the House of Representatives. As Fred Minnick wrote in his book Bourbon, The Rise, Fall, and Rebirth of an American Whiskey, Bourbon makers faced opposition to that resolution from the bourbon distillery operated by Mary Dowling and Beam family members in Juarez, Mexico, since Prohibition. The distillery's owners had ties to New York Congressman John Lindsay, who blocked passage of the resolution until May 4, 1964, when it finally passed the House and gave bourbon a way to compete with Scotch, Irish, and Canadian whiskeys. Of course, that passage came as the bourbon market was about to bottom out as consumers switched to vodka and lighter drinks. But today you can still raise a glass to 60 years of bourbon as America's native spirit. If there's something you'd like us to look at on an upcoming episode, just get in touch with us. Behind the Label is brought to you by Balconis Distilling, the original Texas whiskey at the forefront of the American single malt movement, exploring place and providence with unique style whiskeys, ranging from the award-winning Texas One and Lineage American single malts to their Baby Blue, Straight Corn Whiskey, and Texas Rye Bottled and Bond. Discover whiskey from a new perspective at balconisdistilling.com. That's all for this episode of Whiskey Cast. You'll find links for the stories in this episode in our show notes at whiskeycast.com. That's also where you'll find the latest whiskey news, my tasting notes, the calendar of events, the whiskey photo of the week, and of course a complete archive of past episodes that goes all the way back to 2005. Get in touch with us on X, Threads, Instagram, and Facebook at Whiskey Cast, or you can use the Whiskey Cast community app download it today from the ios and google play app stores our email address is comments at whiskeycast.com jurors double double 21 year old mizanara oak cask finish is like a worldly whiskey adventure you simply can't miss courtesy of your friends at jurors savor it responsibly copyright 2024 jurors blended scotch whiskey 46 percent alcohol by volume and now a message from robin redbreast A thoughtful gift is hard work. What you need is a go-to multi-purpose gift for all occasions. A bottle of Redbreast can say, enjoy every minute, they grow up so fast. And equally nails, apologies for the back pain, I should have just hired a moving company. Proud sponsor of WhiskeyCast, Redbreast. Pass it on. WhiskeyCast is a production of Cask Strength Media, copyright 2024. And comes to you from the charming, yet regrettably dry town of Haddonfield, New Jersey. I'm Mark Gillespie, reminding you that when you drink, please drink responsibly. Thanks for listening.